the whole time? No, sweetness, I'm okay. not. I'm just going to try to see how I can fix it. Uh, Tommy, can you set that up? See, the camera's blocking my purse right there. So, oh, it just ended. We late, we late. We coming, y'all. Here we come, babies. You know all this technology shit. Okay, if you could say it. Somebody said, Harry. <laughs> Here we come. Here we come. All right. Hello, my loves. Hello, my loves. And welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Monique and Sydney's Open Relationship. Hey, my daddy. Hey, my love. Oh, let's get it. Let's make it. Let's make it happen. See, daddy. Okay, you know when we have a large audience, I've got to bring them in with song. Okay, daddy, give me a kiss. Let's start. What are we talking about today, daddy? What are we talking about, baby? Okay, today we are talking about... The deal that was offered to me from Netflix. And we're also going to talk about some of our uh, folks that have opinions and weighing in on what they thought I should do or how they thought I should handle it. But we want to talk about this Netflix uh, deal and we want to talk about why exactly we're asking for this boycott of Netflix and why we're unwavering, why we can't back down. And when you talk to folks, that when you first start talking, they come in ready to fight. I, I, that's unfair. I won't say they come in ready to fight. They come in ready to knock down what you have to say. But once you have to try to make them explain what they're trying to say, they can't. And then they begin to join the boycott. And that's what happened today when we did an interview with Hot 97. Initially, when we started, they were, you know, I don't know, Mo, I don't know. But by the time we got finished, they then said, we are joining the boycott. Which, which to me says that a lot of people are saying a lot of things based upon how it hits them. I don't think that a lot of people are trying to be messed up for the sake of being messed up. It's kind of like when I watched the interview with Tony Rock. Yes. And the guy from TMZ approached him and said, hey, Tony. Uh, Monique, uh, you know, your brother's Chris Rock got the 22 million or 20 million and Monique was pretty much saying she should be in that conversation. Yes. And the way he perceived it, I think is like any other person who you going to walk up on me asking me questions about somebody that seems to be challenging the worthiness of my brother getting what it is that they getting. What she need to do is stop worrying about what Chris get and worry about her stack. Mm -hmm. And based upon that understanding, it makes 110% sense. However, that's not what transpired. What transpired is, in this whole movement, it is not about Amy Schumer or Monique or Dave Chappelle or Chris Rock. It's about Monique and Chris Rock and Dave Chappelle and Amy Schumer and Wanda Sykes and... Come on, baby. Tiffany Haddish and... You know, Samoa and Adele and Miss Laura and, and Cheryl Underwood and the list goes on and on. And the Kim Whitley's. So what happens is, even though these individuals like Steve Harvey, again, Tony Rock, uh, Charlemagne the God, these individuals may have issues and something to say, but I don't think that they really understand that. They'll say how they love their mamas. Come on. They'll say how they love their wife. Come on. They'll say how they love their aunties. Come on. They'll say how they love their daughters and they're working hard so that their daughters don't have to deal with some of the struggles that the women in their lives today and the women that came before them had to deal with. But now you got a black woman who's standing up and saying, why not us too? Not why not me? Why not us all? Everybody who has done something worthy of being witnessed, 
Why can't they get a fair deal if they are a person of color? And when you start looking at the landscape of things and you see there are no black women at Netflix who have a large deal and everyone else of every color, white men, white women, black men have it. But why not the black woman? You know, somebody just put, if I didn't know how much everybody else's deal was with $500,000 being issued, listen, baby. Yes, it would be an issue because we know what those deals bring. And here's what's funny that I have to bring up. There's a, some people saying, oh, my goodness, why don't Monique just take that $500,000 and take her ass on somewhere and shut up? And some of those people look like me. Now, when Amy Schumer was offered $11 million and she went back and said, listen, guys, I don't think I should get what the legends are getting, but I should get more. Come on. Who said, why don't Amy Schumer shut her ass up and take that $11 million? I don't remember Tony Rock saying that. I don't remember Steve Harvey saying that. I don't remember Charlemagne the God saying that. And that was public knowledge. And the reason why they didn't say that is because there was no uproar in reference to her believing that she should get it. There was an uproar because she did not get what it was that they received. And nobody stood up because essentially what is subliminally being said to you, no different from Cadillac Records where Most Def is sitting there with Adrian Brody and he says the Most Def, who's Chuck Berry, I'm going to make you famous, and I'm, he's looking at Adrian Brody, who's white, and I'm going to make you rich. Come on. And we saying, listen, if you notice, they'll make black folks rich. All you got to do is look at one of the most incredible programs they'll make that black are folks on famous. today. One of the most incredible programs on today, and you got to give props, and we're going to give thanks to TV One, is TV One's Unsung. Come on. They telling you the business, guys. They're telling you about how they got taken advantage of. And here's the thing. What they will also bring to the light is it's not just the white man that's raping the black man and the black woman. It is also us, too. Y'all, we're going to have a real conversation today. And if you notice, and this is something that I also want to bring to our community, because now everybody's saying our community, and I appreciate it. We went on a show in New York. It's called the Bernie and Sid Show. Tell them. Two white brothers. Bernie is a strong Republican and a strong Trump supporter. Staunch. Uh, Sid is a Democrat, right? Now, when I go into this interview, I'm already walking in with a preconceived notion that I'm going to have to defend myself because I'm walking in to this white man that's a strong Trump supporter and he's a, Trump, a strong Republican and he's not going to understand my plight as a black woman wanting equality. Already preconceived notion. When I walked in there, after five minutes of me explaining what was happening, these two white men said, listen, this is straight out racism. We are boycotting Netflix. We will not stand by and watch this happen. Monique, when we look at you, we rate you as a 9-10 in the comedy world. When we look at Chris Rock, Dave Chappelle, we rate those men as 9-10s. When we look at Amy Schumer, we, we give her the rating we give her. I said, well, do you think that I'm considered a legend? Those two white brothers said, hands down. Now, I guess where I get passionate and I get my, my feelings um, involved is when I'm sitting there looking at my two white brothers, calling it for what it is. But then when I have my brother, Steve Harvey, go on the air and say, oh, man, and I'm paraphrasing, here she go again. Who she didn't burn a lot of bridges and 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 what she should have done was uh, you go back and you renegotiate. I'm listening to my brother say that, and again I'm paraphrasing. I'm listening to my brother Tony Rock say, I mean I wouldn't consider her great, but she's done some great things. I'm listening to my brother Shalomana God say, she gets donkey of the day. But I'm sitting across from my two white brothers saying. We're going to call this what it is. So when I think about those three in, black in, in a, named Jill, and she's a white sister. In addition to Levity Live Comedy Club, in addition to the Improvs, yes. these are white establishments owned by people who happen to be Caucasian. 
and they're getting behind individuals who are
Steve deal, he began to tell us about Steve Harvey's deal and some money that Steve Harvey was getting. And Sidney said to that man, check this out. Don't you ever disrespect. That's not how I said it. I'm be, sorry. Be, be clear on how I said it. Tell him how you said it, Daddy. It's important because, again, I'm the difficult one. Come on. So it's imperative that how you state things is said. And what was said to him directly was, do me a favor in the future. Please don't give me any of Steve, information, Steve Harvey's personal information. He's a friend and he's a frat brother. And that's his business because you didn't tell me Ty Pennington's quote, who you work with. You're telling me his quote. And I take that personally as a black man as well. Now, somebody said that may be a little strong. But they didn't hear the dialogue prior to that. And then we got a call from Steve Harvey who said, man, they worry that they done blew the deal with you because you took up for me. And I told them, sometimes my fraternity brothers get a little fanatical. And my thing was, I wasn't being fanatical. I was being respectful because we don't need to know what he made. But to call us back immediately on behalf of them and then we not get a return call after it's all said and done, from our understanding, there were some things that transpired that didn't make it go down. Whatever it is, all we're saying is, if you keep taking less, when can you ever get more? And this is not saying Steve Harvey, and I want to reiterate this, Steve Harvey, Charlemagne, Tony, Netflix, none of them are bad. None of them. Are, I, I don't. We don't want to make this a war on who they are as human beings. Not uh -uh. at all. Because he does a lot for the folks in the community. And it's no question. What we're saying is, you're forgetting that it was women of color that put us here. If you are a man of color, and now you have a woman of color trying to stand up for all women. However, in this specific incident, uh, women of color. Why is that a problem? Why is that a problem? And again, see, Daddy, I have to tell the story because I keep hearing these people give their opinions, but y'all aren't sharing the conversations that's had in private. And that's what's not appreciated. See, once we began to talk about doing this deal, months went by, and we reached out to our brother Steve Harvey, and the calls never got returned. And then when we finally got the word, the talk show was not going to go because Steve Harvey was not going to get the money that he wanted to get. Now, we don't know if that's true or not because don't Steve know. Harvey never reached out to us. So this is what I'm saying to my brother Steve Harvey. What happened with you and I? And when did my character get in question? that you would begin to say, Monique's burned some bridges. And the bridges you're speaking about is Oprah, Tyler, and Lee. And here's what I would say to Steve Harvey in reference to me burning bridges with these people. Steve, if it were your daughter or your grandbaby, and she came to you and she said, Papa, these people have violated me. They've put me in a position, Papa, where they've affected my livelihood. Do you tell your grandbaby or your daughter, listen, you don't want to burn those bridges, so sit down and be quiet? Or to, do you tell your grandbaby or your daughter, hey, sweetness, we got to take a stand, baby, because I know what you've done. I know what you've done, and what we can't do is allow this to happen. See, what you're doing is saying to the public, because you have their ear, Monique is wrong without giving me the platform to say, well, prove me wrong then, y'all. I'm asking y'all to prove a sister wrong. When somebody puts in the room and they put, I'm sorry, no, no, daddy, no, no, no. and they put LOL, Monique says she's the most decorated comedian alive. Well, that's funny as shit. Well, daddy, I don't. It, it, it's one of those things where it is humorous when you hear it said, out of context, but when you put it in context and you say, well, Monique has had 57 wins. As an actor, an actress, and comedian, 57 wins and 25 nominations. Brother Chris Rock, who was highly decorated, has 19 wins and 63 nominations. Now, here's the thing. 
A brother got 63 nominations and only got 19 wins within itself. That's crazy. You got Dave Chappelle. What's this? Five wins, 12 noms, Eddie Murphy, 30 wins, 72 nominations. And these nominations are extraordinarily high for the wins that they had. Yes. Do you understand? But she has 57 wins. And then Amy Schumer has 17 wins and 38 nominations. Now, the next closest person who is a comedian to Monique is, as it pertains to uh, major awards is Eddie Murphy with 30 awards and 72 nominations. And she has 57. Now, what we're saying is this. Every one of those individuals are proven and should get what they have gotten. They deserve it. You can't go hating on Amy Schumer because she got a $13 million deal. You got to say cheers and raise your wine glass. Same to Dave. Same to Chris. Same to all the cats. All we're saying is, what about the black women in comedy? That's all. What about the black women? You've proven that you'll pay white men. You've proven that you'll pay black men. Come on. You've proven that you'll pay white women. But there is no proof that you will pay black women. And when you, this is the coup de grace for me. The Queens of Comedy, Wanda Sykes, in the realm of comedy where she hangs, if Come you on. will. Name three funnier comedians of color and who have done more than them. Than, than, than that crew. You can't. Just, just name it. You name can't. them. And because you can't name them is the reason why you've got to give them room to breathe so they can make money. You've got to give them room to breathe so they can make money because if Monique takes 500 grand and she has 57 wins and 25 noms, what does a person get who's just gut bucket funny and never got nominated because the people who have the ability to judge and have opinion have favors that don't look like them? Someone would say, what more do you have to do? What? And something I want to share with y'all because, Daddy, I, I, I want to speak to the brothers that spoke to me. I have to. When it comes to Brother Steve, again, I say, what happened between you and I that you won't even pick up the phone? When it comes to Brother Charlemagne the God, when I heard him call me donkey of the day, see, this is the same brother that got on the elevator at the Monique show and was very respectful and I said to him, as we were joking, I said, baby, give your mama a hug from me because she raised you right. And that baby looked at me and said, yes, ma'am. And we had a beautiful moment. So to hear this young man call me a donkey of the day, I would say to him, why do you have so much hatred towards black women? Because that's what that is. You can't cut it. You can't dice it. You can't slice it. That's hatred towards your sisters. And when you have people that say about our relevance. See, there was a woman named Moms Mabley. I don't want y'all to forget her. There was a documentary done on her. And they spoke about her brilliance. They spoke about all that she gave to the world of comedy and to the world at large they spoke about this woman how she was just a genius mm -hmm. but what they didn't speak about is she died broke mm -hmm. not because she squandered her money see they'll make y'all believe we just de we dumb niggas and these niggas don't know what they're doing with their money and see how long no it's just that we don't get the monies we do who else lawanda page iconic Legendary. If you say you fish out fool anywhere in the world, they will say that's Aunt Esther. I don't care what color you are, what language you speak. If you say you fish out fool, they're going to know that's Aunt Esther. She died broke. Red Fox. We watched that story. Now, for the younger generation who are saying to me about relevancy, irrelevancy, and you're speaking about, oh, it's a different time, I want to bring your, one of your babies to light that maybe you can relate to. Lisa Left Eye Lopez. She died broke. I want to bring another baby home that maybe y'all can relate to. 
Tupac Shakur. He died broke. So all of the programs we're watching right now on this brother, who benefits from that money? Who gets it? Not his mama, because she went to the next journey as well. And you've seen the shows on TV where you had brother, uh, I, I can't call his name, brother rerun for what's happening. He was telling the Stubbs. cast. He was telling the cast. What, Frederick Stubb? Yes, sir. He was telling the cast, hey, we got a hit. We're not getting the money that we're supposed to get. And Fred Barry, there you go. He, we, we, we got the numbers, but we not getting the money, guys. Come on, let's stand together. And guess what happened? They stayed quiet. And what happened to Miss Hemphill? What happened? A legend. And if you talk to Brother Raj the day who played Raj the day, mm -hmm. what would he say? He would say that we weren't treated nor paid fairly, and that Fred Barry was right. And y'all, when you hear that our sister, Shirley Hemphill, see, this is when I don't understand the sisters. And I don't want to put a color on it because there have been my white sisters that have been standing in support like, Mo, this is some bullshit, Absolutely. baby. We got your back. Absolutely. So I don't want to put a color on it. I want to say my sisters. When you hear some of my sisters saying, fuck that bitch. Oh, baby, that's what they saying. When you hear my sister saying, are you out your fucking mind? She's only worth $2 million. And that's our sister from the Breakfast Club. I'm not sure of her name, so I don't want to say it because I don't want to say it wrong. But she's on with Charlemagne and the other brother. But when you hear that Shirley Hemphill died in a one-room apartment with a spider pot next to her bed, is that because she squandered her money? Or is that because she just wasn't paid the money she was supposed to get? So y'all are quick to say all that we didn't do, but you won't say what they haven't done. And at Influence, look, you are so right. It's they self-hate. And what happens is the question is not why do we self-hate. It's almost how do you not self-hate when you've been conditioned to do so? Mm. And now you have to ask yourself, are you willing to love you enough to say, hey, listen, because what we're not trying to do, again, the first rule of sales is you never, ever bash someone else's product. We're not going to sit here and tell you nothing bad about any one of those individuals who, who are getting what it is that they're supposed to get. Again, you, can. gotta, you can't and you want to rejoice for them. However, there have been some individuals that brought up... Um, Ms. Schumer's statistics in terms of movies and back to the to, to the Netflix piece. Yes, sir. I got an opportunity to speak with Robbie Prawl, who is in charge of the comedy specials over at Netflix, the VP. And in talking with him, he was a nice person, very professional, and the whole nine. The interesting aspect of it was that made us say this seems a bit color and gender bias was when we came, when he presented the offer and we came back to have a discussion I said how did you come up with this offer based upon what you provided for other people and he said we use a, a, a anticipatory process mm -hmm. and I said well what exactly is an anticipatory process we anticipate what an artist is going to do on Netflix, and that allows us to offer them the number. So I said, well, what about Monique's resume, her body of work, the movies that she's done? Well, that doesn't translate with us here at Netflix, and we don't include that. Okay, well, how did you get to the number for Amy Schumer? Well, I'm glad you asked me that, is what he said. He said, she sold out Madison Square Garden twice. And she came out with a hit movie this summer. Now, the movie she came out with was called Snatched. So, to those astute listeners out there, if you're paying attention, when he said what we were looking at, and not in entirety, but in part, is Madison Square Garden, her selling it out twice. And then her movie, mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen, that is her resume. That's her resume.
because that is the history of the work that she has done to substantiate what you're giving her in the present. So we said, if you are going to tell us you won't include Monique's resume, why are you including hers? Talk we want to we want to know what's so different that you're going to say that you don't use the resume, but you're casually explaining to us that you are. And when those things can't get explained, that's when people will say, oh, Monique's husband is difficult. And we've been dealing with that for some years now because people simply can't explain themselves. They'll say Monique's husband is difficult. And then when you get the brothers to jump on board and you're saying, but did you even ask any questions so it can be explained? See, when you hear Brother Steve Harvey giving advice about how we should do business and the way, and I'm paraphrasing, the way you do this is they give you an offer and you counter and you go back. Well, Steve Harvey, Netflix said there was no counter. There was no negotiating. The number was what it was, take it or leave it. Now, Brother Steve, what do you do now? And someone just said Amy Schumer made $100 million on the film. What was it? Trainwreck? Yes. And that's why you got to give her props. That's why we sitting here saying we can't take nothing away from her. And when you did that, I believe that was in the year 2014. So that means you are going to include things that happened years ago, are you not? Mm -hmm. So why would we not include the fact that Monique got nominated for an Emmy with Bessie? Why would we not include that Monique was the fan favorite, uh, was voted fan favorite in the movie Almost Christmas? That Let me just give you some numbers because you spoke about the $100 million that Amy Schumer made, which is a hit. And... Uh, Robbie Prawl spoke about the, the hit that she had called Snatch. And sometimes when you look at the numbers, it helps you get a better understanding why people say what they say. But let's just try apples to apples. There's Snatch and there's Almost Christmas, which Monique was in. The, domest the domestic total gross for Snatch was $45,852,178. That was the domestic gross that Snatch made, which is... A nice sum of money. Now, almost Christmas is forty-two million one hundred and fifty-eight thousand seven hundred and eighty. Or in short, for everybody, because the the numbers are a little long, forty-five million dollars, forty-six million dollars for Snatch, forty-two million dollars for Almost Christmas. Okay. Now, somebody would say that's a dumbass comparison because Almost Christmas made less than Snatch. Hold tight. The prop production budget for Snatched was $42 million. I'm going to say it again. The production budget for Snatched was $42 million, and the domestic gross for Snatched was $46 million in rounding it off, which gives it a $4 million profit. Mm. Almost Christmas had a $42 million budget, and a, I'm sorry, a $42 million profit and a $17 million budget which gave them a $25 million profit, okay? Now, if a $4 million profit puts Amy Schumer in a place that she was in a blockbuster, we're not going to dispute that. We're just saying, how does someone that's in a movie that they're the fan, fan favorite, that it made $25 million? And not only did it make $25 million off of $17 million, it had less theater seats available to it. Almost Christmas had 2,300 seats available to it. On average, Snatch had 3,500, which implies if they had more seats, would they have made more money? And see, I want to address something, too, because people are putting in here, Monique was not the star of Almost Christmas. Let's address it. When you do a screening, right? And I, Daddy, could you give the numbers? Because I want to be as humble as I can. Well, well, well here's, the, here's the thing. You're only sharing with them what transpired that's to make all. a point. And see, what we're saying is, under normal circumstances, that's why Kendrick Lamar has the song Be Humble. Because we're supposed to shut up and not say anything to make our point. 
But these points that you make are what allow you to substantiate your client's deal. You must have points to make. So the point that she's essentially saying is she didn't consider herself the star of the, the film. She did not personally consider herself the star of the film. But the audience who pre-screened the film, who voted that gave the film the highest rating almost Christmas that it had for a universal film in its genre in the last 10 years. And what makes that point is that when you are the considered the highlight of the film by that same audience that is voting the film the highest rated in the last 10 years, it should have some relevancy. And we're just saying, why would it not? Why would it not? And for the brothers and sisters that are in the room saying, but you weren't not the star. Are y'all paying attention, though, to the numbers? Because let's say Gabrielle Union was in that film. Kimberly Elise was in that film. J.B. Smooth was in that film. And the list goes on and on. So their next films, did they get multi-million dollar paychecks? Because Almost Christmas made a $25 million profit domestically. So ask any of those people, their next films, did they get multi-million dollar offers? See, I don't care how y'all try to dice it and slice it. You can't make it make sense. Now, you do have those ones because what I have to understand, Daddy, is, and I said to my daddy today, I said, I had a strange conversation. Yeah. He said, Mama, what? I walked in the closet. I said, Daddy, I talked to Ida B. Wells. And he looked at me and said, what? I said, I talked to Ida B. Wells, and she said, Monique, you've got to call their asses to the table. Call. You've got to call them to the table, and you've got to call it for what it is. Because I asked my, I said, Daddy, does this seem like Conan? When you have black men going against their sisters, does that seem like any form of cooning to you? And Ida B. Wells said, Monique, call them to the table. Because when you read her book, and she wrote her own story. There are some men in history that she had to call to the table that we hold in high esteem. But when you read a book, baby, she had to call those brothers to the table. And I want to address something else real quick, Daddy, before I address John Mary and Cheryl Underwood. I want to address the folks that are saying, Monique's husband. Oh, Monique's husband. I understand why you would say that with... Uh, trepidation. Okay. <laughs> now, okay, give it, it to me, it. give it to me. Get it. I understand because tell me about the man in history that you read about that stood next to Harriet Tubman. Tell me his name. Tell me about the man that we read about in our history books that stood side by side with Harriet Tubman when she said, I've got to make a change. Tell me about the man in our history books that you read about that stood side by side with Eartha Kitt when she said it's inequality. Tell me about him. Tell me about the man that stood side by side to Hattie McDaniel when she had to say, I'd rather play a maid than be a maid. Please don't take my livelihood. Tell me about the man in history that stood with her. Tell me about the man in history that stood with Nina Simone when she said we're fighting for change. Tell me about the man in history that stood with our sister Oprah when she said, I don't eat beef. I'm not telling y'all not to eat the goddamn beef. I just don't eat the beef no fucking more. And the farmers wanted to sue that woman. But tell me about the man that stood with her when she had to have that fight. Who, did, who was she standing with when she came out the courtroom? She was standing hand. with her white attorneys. So I understand when my sisters and my brothers have so much to say about my husband. But this is what I will say to my sisters and brothers. Don't allow people to divide the person that you've asked the universe to allow you to share the rest of your life with. And they do it so well that they will convince you that your husband or your wife can't be your best partner and you've got to go to somebody else who when they go to bed at night, they ain't thinking about your black ass. They're not thinking about your family because they're not supposed to be. They're thinking about theirs. Mm -hmm. So I will keep standing, sisters, for my man. And I'm going to keep standing for my woman. And, mm -hmm. and if I may, the reason why 
it's imperative that I stand for my wife, for my mama. Because somebody said, oh, that's creepy that she calls him daddy and mama. Was it creepy when you saw the old white folks call each other ma and pa? No, it's the same term of endearment. But the reason why I stand with her is because I was raised by a grandmother whose husband did not stand with her. Mm -hmm. So, and I don't want to get emotional. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but when I think about what a woman in 1903 did not get in terms of opportunities, and she told me about the eight papers that she had, when she was in medical school. But my grandfather with that. He would not allow her to pursue a dream. And she said, when you become a man, you allow your wife to do what it is that she wants to do and you inspire her and you allow her to live out her dreams and she will always appreciate that and I gotta keep my promise so to these black men out there did you make a promise mm. to your mom to your grandma that you you're gonna stand by and I'm not crying cause I'm sad I'm crying cause I'm overjoyed Come on, that I'm doing right by my grandma and by my, my wife, my mother, my mama. And they say, you cannot be admired unless you are first criticized. And we are appreciative, not just of the admiration from a standpoint of outside beings, but we need to admire one another as our family. And as long as we have the admiration of our family, my kids, my wife, We've already won. Netflix, they don't have to do nothing. We're going to move on. It's all good. But what we're trying to say is, if we look out for one, we should look out for all. My bad, baby. No, my daddy. And see, I have a gentleman as a husband. And he won't say the things that I'll say. Because he's a gentleman. And I've taken the charge. Tommy, could you hold this, please, and try to get this situated? Oh. I've taken the charge of being loud. I've taken the charge of being tacky. I've taken the charge of being ratchet. I've taken those charges. But when I sit next to a king, and that king says to me, Mama, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of you. I'm going to say it the best way I can say it. And see, when my sons sit at the dinner table and their daddy begins to explain to them what their mama is dealing with. That's all. And our boys look at their daddy and they look at their mama and they go, Wow, we so proud of y'all. So, when y'all want to question me, why I call him daddy, let me tell you why I call him daddy. Because he raising me, goddammit. See, if this man wasn't on my side, do you know how many motherfuckers people would have been? Do you know how many coons people would have been? Do you know how tacky I would have gotten? Though y'all know I would have been right. Though y'all know I would have been right, but this man is teaching me to have empathy and love. This man is saying to me, Mama, for the black woman who won't stand for you, I'm going to need you to love him through it. He's saying to me, Mama, for the black man who won't stand for you, I'm going to need you to love him through it. Now, my, I want to say, fuck them niggas. But this man sitting next to me, he's saying, I need you to learn empathy and patience. So for y'all that want to question shit, I get it, because you ain't seen your mama be loved by nobody. I get it. See, and I'm going to say it because it's on my heart. See, everybody talking about Oprah Winfrey for president. 
and we are rattling behind her. The black women are saying, yeah, 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 but let me ask y'all a question. Whenever did she rally behind us? When? What award show did she get up on the stage and say, hashtag me too? What sister? Is there, and I want to say this, please. Jada Pinkett Smith, let me say something to you, baby. Me and you come from the same place called Baltimore, Maryland. And me and you know what it is to walk on the streets of our city and see inequality. Because we cut from the same cloth. So I want to thank you, baby, for standing. And that she said, y'all may not, may not like how she said it or the way she said it, but God damn it, she said it. Because I will ask any of y'all uncourageous asses, whenever has change happened with fucking silence? When? Whenever has a difference been made and we didn't say shit? So y'all scared niggas out there, keep being scared. Then you, you're asking me, and see y'all are asking me, and I appreciate the questions. I appreciate John Mary. John Mary is a black journalist. And I got to give that brother his props. He is a journalist. I wanted to call him a gossip columnist, but that was unfair of me. But he, that's, doesn't he consider himself a gossip he columnist? He considers himself a journalist that does a gossip column, <laughs> nigga. Okay, <laughs> respect this, man. <laughs> respect him. That's right. Okay? Woo. And when you have the pen and paper, that's powerful. And this black man for years, for years, have put things to paper about me that he couldn't prove. And there was a time he was on Cafe Mocha with Lonnie Love and another sister. And he was saying how foolish I was for not going to con and my husband was fucking it up and he was trying to compare me to Will Smith and just a bunch of bullshit. And when he couldn't prove it, his ass began to run. So now when I say on the Sway Show, and I said it humbly, I said, y'all, I say this humbly, but I am the most decorated comedian alive. I didn't say it with vanity. I didn't, because it can be proven. Well, this brother went and did a, a meme of Whoopi Goldberg and all these other comedians, and he gave his commentary on what he thought about me, and me and my husband had alternative facts, and, and all this bullshit. So when I say to this brother, hey, brother, check this out. Tell me what the alternative facts are, because you may have a point. His ass ran when he said, you have a list of untruths. And I say, John Mary, give me my list of untruths. And he runs. But see, y'all, that pen and paper is powerful. And oftentimes, we don't have the platforms to defend ourselves. So we'll accept what someone says and say it's law. But we're going to go to the lines right now, baby, because we've been talking the show and see what you're thinking, how you feel. Hey, you're on with Monique and Sydney. Who's this and where you're calling from? Veronica Smith, of Doha, Qatar. Talk to us, Veronica. Thanks for calling in. You said Qatar? Qatar. I work with the military. I'm a civilian. I've been watching you on your interviews. And I'm You know, sis, we appreciate that. And it's not like we're not trying. See, we have a movie out there that we executive produced called Blackbird. We have a movie out there that we executive produced called Interwoven. So it's, and, and when, when my brothers and sisters say that to us, we want y'all to understand it ain't like, baby, we ain't there trying to, we ain't out there trying to make it happen. But not, but in, adi but in addition to that, because you, you make a good point. All of those things are what we're pursuing, but what happens is you have to pinpoint where a problem is because, as a prime example, Sister Wanda Sykes, she had a situation with Netflix. The world never knew until Monique spoke up, and now, and then there was two. And then it illuminates the fact that there are no black women who have been paid ever in the history of comedy. Name me one black woman who's got paid a Richard Pryor, a Kevin Hart, a Melissa McCarthy, a Roseanne, a Rosie, tell me, an Ellen DeGeneres, tell me one black female comedian that has ever gotten that opportunity. And that's the reason why we had to take a stance right now. Yes, yes. And I totally agree with you. Don't think that what I say, you know, was, you know, saying anything against anything else. Mm -mm. I just feel like when I watched your interview on uh, Sway, about two nights ago, I was like, man, listen, 
I just feel like Monique can just really do her own thing um, and just still, you know, make a kill. And I just, that's just my personal opinion. I've been watching everything you on UPN. Wow, baby. Thank you for calling. <laughs> Thank you, my baby. Okay, I'm curious, though. I mean, listen, I, I mean, I'm not rich, but I said, hey, listen, if you, you got to pull together some independent funds. I'll put some money down for it. <laughs> you better speak it to the universe. Thank we you love you, sister. Much. And, you know, I have to address this sister as well. Because this is what we do to our communities. We poison us. And when we don't know any better, we'll applaud a lie. I watch my sister Cheryl Underwood sit on that stage on the, is it the real? The talk. The talk. And she said, let me be clear about something. I never told Monique to take low offers. I told Monique when we talked that if she asked for forgiveness from Oprah Winfrey, Lee Daniels, and Tyler Perry, that things would be okay. Ladies and gentlemen all around the world, because we just got a call in from Qatar. Cheryl Underwood is telling a lie. I can't call my sister a liar, but what I will say is she's lying. In that incident. In that incident, I have the proof of the conversation that Cheryl Underwood and I had that it will show that that's not how that conversation went. And if Cheryl Underwood would have said to me, you need to ask for forgiveness, the first thing I would have said to her was, what am I asking for forgiveness for? But when Cheryl Underwood called me, what she said was, Monique, I know you're not lying and I know you right. And that's when I said, bitch, then why are we here? And that's when she got into a really big hurry. She was catching a flight. I got to get to the airport. Got to get to my plane. That sister sat on that stage. And not only did she lie to the world, she lied to the sister sitting there in front of her. And when you have women applauding a lie, that's how we poison our community. Now, it's awfully strange that the sister that everyone is calling so wrong, Steve Harvey, Cheryl Underwood, why won't they have us on the show to look us in our eyes and say, this is what you've done wrong. But what they'll do is be cowardly, and they'll speak it in a segment. They'll get the applause and say, phew, I dodged that goddamn bullet. Because they both know, if me and my husband were to come sit face to face with them, it'd be a different kind of story. So we have to, y'all, unite in just what's right. We got to do that. And... When we look at uh, that, like the conversation that you had with uh, Sister Cheryl, what's disappointing is, again, you're fighting for them to be able to go to a Netflix or go somewhere and get a fair wage. It would be one thing if we would be saying, we just want it for her, and Dave shouldn't get it, and Chris shouldn't get it, and this person shouldn't get it. Why? No, we're saying... All of the individuals that receive what they receive, come on now, give them that prize. Give it to them. All we're saying is when a black woman is involved in a scenario, why can't she get her props? Why is that difficult? Why is it that, and you, you pointed it out earlier, why is it not a disruption that Amy Schumer received $13 million or $11 million and it becomes a disruption because she didn't get more? But now Monique should shut up because she asked for more than $500,000. And that's what we've been taught in the history of black women in this country. Black women? I'm sorry. I'm right, baby. Correct me, daddy. People. Come on now. Okay, shit. Okay, I just got a little selfish in my space. Come on. Bring me back. Just people. So, again, and someone put in the room, it's a damn shame Steve Harvey would meet with Donald Trump but not with our sister. Oh, come on. So, when Ida B. Wells says, call him to the mat, what do y'all call that? And I remember when he came out that meeting with Donald Trump, he said he a good man. That's what he said, he a good man. But you on your radio show saying that this woman is messing it up. And let me say one more thing. And what, 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 what y'all don't hear is, see y'all, again, y'all don't know about Monique going to 
these schools around the country, mm -hmm. talking to these kids in school that look hopeless. The teachers, they look even more hopeless. So that when she's looking at them, she's got to make this stand right now because she's going to look in that eye. And if she looks the other way right now, how can she look them in the eye and tell them to stay strong mm -hmm. for the opportunities that lie ahead if we happy that they acknowledging us you was kind you is small and you was important and because of that